a sec. Uh, what I want to do is basically go over some books that I'm reading um, and discuss them, partly because after I finish reading a book, I don't feel like I completely understand what happened. I mean, I understand the general gist, but not... Not enough such that I could basically make a, a valid argument as to what exactly happened. So this is the first one um, And this time I am choosing a book that just came out. It's called why we're polarized. It's by Ezra Klein and Ezra Klein uh, I have this page open so that we can all kind of look at it um, but He is the the founder of Vox and uh, I don't know if this is his first book or not, um, but uh, he's, I guess he's you know he's he's pretty pretty well known. Vox is is pretty big, and uh, according to this book, he was kind of referencing to himself a little bit. He's been doing kind of journalism. Has been in the kind of in politics for even though he's young, he's been doing it for twenty years now. So he's seen a lot of stuff, and he, he wanted to write about it, and especially with the election coming up. Um, this book is basically about the polarization that currently exists between the Republican Democrat Party and why it's so uh, divisive. And I think by writing this, he wanted to come up with an argument or a diagnosis as to why it's polarized. Um, and I think, I mean, it, he he makes a lot of good arguments, um, but almost too many arguments in the same way. He basically tries to create this narrative, and I'll I'll go over the narrative later. But he creates the narrative, and the way that he basically logically constructs the narrative is by always referencing all these studies that happen, and he almost does it too much. I mean. I uh, understand kind of, you know, people do these studies, and it's like their full-time job, and they come up with these results. But you can't just say, this is truth because someone did a study about it. There's lots of different, it's more complex than that. And he kind of does that, and it kind of puts the burden on the reader, because if you really want to accept his argument, you're going to have to look at all the studies that he referenced. and basically see whether he, they're saying what he's claiming them or whether the study was actually done correctly you know I mean, sure these people who did the studies they're phds but that doesn't mean that the study is automatically valid you have to go and vet that so anyway that's a little bit too much of an intro the reason why i picked this book up is not because i'm very politically inclined uh I think more books that I'm going to go over in this channel are, are going to be more philosophical, more 20th century, 19th century books. That's generally what I read, um, just because uh, there's certain authors that I really like. Um, but I picked this up because I'm taking a political philosophy class, and the first class, the professor uh, basically gave his view as to why there was a division between like the two parties right now and he came up with a very similar concept to the synopsis of this book i was i was reading through the new york times book review and basically both people or both my professor and ezra klein both said that it had to do with identity politics um, it's kind of a new word that's being thrown around and uh Usually, well, when, when I get the same information from two separate sources that are like completely isolated, I, I think they're isolated. I mean, maybe he read this book and started basically making that argument. And I don't think he did though. Um, he might've. Um, when, when I s see two pieces of like the pattern happening in two separate places, it kind of signals to me that, hey, maybe this is worth reading. Maybe I should check it out. So, so I checked it out. Um, 
Sorry, one second, let me get this set up here. Cool. So this is what the book looks like. Nice hardcover copy. Um, and maybe to start, I can just kind of read, uh, you know, you look at the inside of the book when you're at a bookstore and see whether it would sound good to you. So I'll just read the front cover. It says, uh, in Why We're Polarized, Klein reveals the structural and psychological forces behind America's descent into division and dysfunction. Neither a polemic nor a lament, this book offers a clear framework for understanding everything from Trump's rise to the Democratic, Democratic Party's leftward shift to the politicization of everyday culture. America is polarized, first and foremost, by identity. Everyone engaged in American politics is engaged, at some level, in identity politics. Over the past 50 years in America, our partisan identities have merged with our racial, religious, geographical, ideological, and cultural identities. These merged identities have attained a weight that is breaking much in our politics and tearing at the bonds that hold this country together. Klein shows how and why American politics polarized around identity in the 20th century and what that polarization did to the way we see the world and one another. And he traces the feedback loops between polarized political identities and polarized political institutions that are driving our system toward crisis. This is a revelatory book that will change how you look at politics and perhaps yourself. All right, so lots of, lots of broad sweeping claims. This is, this book's going to change everything. Yeah, I mean, I, this is good. I enjoyed it, but yeah. All right. Um, so the way we want to structure this is um, I kind of wrote notes for myself about each of the sections, and we'll go through each of the sections. Um, so maybe by the end of this, you'll feel like uh, one, maybe after this, like kind of me going through the book, you might want to read the book for yourself because maybe there's some ideas that I say that you might enjoy. Um, or are you just looking for to learn something? and uh, possibly you have questions and maybe I can answer those questions, maybe I can't, but maybe we can have a discussion about it. Cool. Okay. Uh, so the introduction section. Let me get my notes up. Sorry, give me one second. All right. So in the introduction, Ezra Klein starts off at a point where uh, he takes it like the beginning from the 2016 election where Trump beat uh, Clinton. And uh, I think we all kind of look back at that, at least I do, and I know other of my friends who do. and. They see it as an event that is kind of like an exceptional event like how and, and kind of the question is like how did this happen and uh, clinton actually wrote a book after uh the race the title of the book is called what happened so there is kind of this general feeling of like something happened something weird happened something out of the ordinary and the introduction kind of takes this feeling and questions it and it's is, is this some kind of exceptional event that we could have never foreseen happen? Or is this possibly part of a trend that's been happening over the last 20 years? And uh, basically this book, I think, is trying to make that argument without what happened with the 2016 election where Trump got elected. Um, it's not just kind of this one-time thing, exceptional event that we're not going to be able to explain. It's it's actually a trend, and it's going to continue. And this trend is called polarization, and it's happening in this kind of context called identity politics. So that's the introduction. Um, it's, there's more to it, but that's that's the general idea. The first chapter is called uh, 
actually I can't I can't show the book on the screen, but I can show my notes. So maybe yeah, maybe you appreciate having my notes here. All right. I'll go full screen this. That didn't really full screen, did it? Okay. Okay, so the first chapter starts back in the 1950s and it basically takes, uh, basically looks at the Democratic and the Republican parties back then and sees how they're different uh, between now and then. And one of the kind of immediate things is that the Republicans as a conservative party isn't, it isn't as distinguished as it was back then than it is now. There was really no thing called a Republican identity that was conservative. And sure, there were conservative Republicans, but sometimes a Republican would vote, um, like a Republican president might um, help Democratic state-level uh, representatives. It wasn't so polarized as it is now. And um, it kind of makes a short argument of like why parties were important back then in the beginning. And he makes a valid claim. Eh, the parties are shortcuts. Like the electorate can't understand the pros and the cons of all of the policies. They're very complex. They require full-time jobs of people, you know, politicians, hopefully, uh, looking at these policies and evaluating them and determining whether they're worth passing or not. The electorate can't do that on their own. They have their private lives. They want to you know, do that. So <clears throat> there is a need kind of for parties. Um, but uh, because each party had both political and conservative aspects, it was difficult for uh, voters to actually understand which policies are passing by voting for a Democrat or Republican. Since there was such kind of a mishmash between the two, um, like if I agreed on if, if I wanted a policy to pass and it was both supported by Republicans and Democrats, I wouldn't know which one to vote for. I didn't know which one, to which degree they actually accepted that policy. It's, it was confusing. You know, today we kind of think, uh, you know, I'm uh, against abortion. I, yeah. Or I'm a for abortion. It's, it, it's, uh, yeah, I'm clearly Democrat then, right? It's, there, there's certain policies where it's just clearly divided. Um, it wasn't like that back then. Okay. Um, let's see. Right. So there wasn't that much division between two parties, and they actually worked really well together. And that's what kind of decreased the power of the electorate. Um, or not the electorate, the, the voters. I mean, if the two parties are in cahoots with each other, they're just going to pass whatever they want to pass. You know, whether you vote for a Republican or Democrat, um, you really have no say. So, um, and since it was such a mishmash uh, during the election of Jimmy Carter, only 54% of the electorate believed that the Republican Party was actually more conservative than the Democrat Party. Um, and 30% of people said that there was no ideological difference between the parties. So, again, just kind of restating the point that the parties were not very different back then and then they actually worked together to pass legislation and, and do what they wanted you know, there's compromise between the parties it's, it's not like today where it's this or that and there's no in between there's no middle ground there was middle ground back then um cool so ticket splitting um i'm not, I think today there isn't really much ticket splitting. I mean, I you'd have to talk with maybe your friends and ask them whether they ticket split or they vote completely Democrat, completely Republican. But what this book claims is that ticket splitting was a pretty common practice. Um, for example, uh, the South, um, we'll, we'll get into this. Um, the South uh, Democrats were called the Dixiecrats and they were made up of white supremacists who basically wanted segregation in the South, and they're Democrats. So, if you wanted liberal policies, you'd have to vote 
you know, Democrat to be a president, but then you wouldn't want to vote Democrat to be like um, in the Senate uh, for Southern states. Um, so a common thing that people would do is that they would vote for a Democratic president and vote for Republican uh, senators. Um, so again, kind of the ideological differences between the Democrat and the Republican parties was less distinguished. Um, so in, in 1964, 80% of voters aligned with a party. And in 2012, that dropped to 63%. And so this is kind of a weird thing. Um, we think we're very polarized today, but we th see ourselves as not being a part of either the Republican or the Democratic Party. So why is that? And the one explanation that Ezra Klein gives is uh, there's this thing called negative partisanship. And it's that we don't see ourselves a part of a party. We see ourselves as independents, but we see ourselves as independents voting against another party. We're not voting for a party. So majority of people who are voting for the Democratic candidate are actually voting against the Republican candidate and vice versa. So we're not aligned with our party, but we're still polarized in that we're voting for a certain candidate. <clears throat> Grab some water or tea. All right. And so between like 1950 and now, um, the gap between policies started increasing. Again, kind of 1950, both Republicans and Democrats were supporting the same policies. They're working with each other to pass the same policies and the voters didn't really have any say. And as time went on, policies started being shaped through the parties. There were ideological differences between Democrats and Republicans. So for example, 32% uh, Democrats and 30% of Republicans agreed that uh, immigrants strengthened the country in 1994. Now, if you go to 2017, 84% of Democrats agree that immigrants strengthen the country, while 42% of Republicans uh, agree. So, I mean, both the numbers went up, but there's a, there's, there's a major difference there. There is much more polarization. There's a 40% uh, differential there. Um, and since there's a difference between the two, people kind of, there's, there's it's, it's different, dif more difficult to reconcile between the two groups. And if you go down here in 1950, uh, voters, um, what did I say? So yeah, 1950 voters, uh, Oh wait, no, that's, that's probably a typo. They couldn't really distinguish between the two parties, but in 2014, 37% of Republicans and 31% of Democrats found the other party as a threat. Well, in 2016, those numbers went up to 45% and 41% respectively. So if you look at the numbers, or at least the exit polls, or not the exit polls, just uh, surveys that were done, you can see that um, there is more division happening over time. And again, Ezra Klein is making this argument that it, it started in the, in the 1950s and it continued on. And so the chapter two is all about kind of that transformation that happened in the 1950s. And it has to do with the Dixiecrats. And the, the, Dix, the Dixiecrats are, um, they were the Southern Democratic Party. Um, Again, we think of Democrats as being liberal, which is you know equality for all, being for diversity. But in the 1950s, uh, the Democratic Party was run by basically white supremacists. And they called themselves the Dixiecrats. And they were very powerful. They had control of 95% of elected offices. And the way that they kept control is you know, similar as we see it today with the Republican Party, the voter suppression. Um, it's actually quite astounding. Uh, in the book, he says that in 1994, 5% of African Americans, only 5% were registered to vote. And if you, if you go back to after the Civil War, that number was 85 to 94%. So it's, it's kind of ridiculous. It's like we've gone back to the Confederacy um, because of the Dixiecrats. 
So the I guess the the question is why did the National Democratic Party why did they work with the Dixiecrats? This is totally against their belief system. I mean, the Democrats were worried about welfare, were worried about health care, uh, were worried about civil rights issues, actually, not the racial divide. Um, and in the South, primarily what they cared about was segregation. They wanted to keep it going. Uh, they wanted to be in power. The reason why the National Democrats uh, wanted um, the South on their side is because without the South, they wouldn't have enough voting power in the Senate. They wouldn't be able to even pass a presidential nominee. They would need to have um, the South approve their Democratic nominee for president before continuing. So uh, the Democrats had to basically uh, allow for the segregation to continue happening up until uh, about the 1950s, 1960s. So there's an ideological difference between the National Democratic Party and the Dixiecrats. Um, but this is, this is bound to change because since the Democrats were basically becoming more liberal, um, they were becoming basically a vehicle for the civil rights movement. Uh, they passed legislation for military desegregation in the 1940s, started welfare programs to move uh, uh, money from rich whites to uh, poor blacks. And finally, in, uh, what was it? I think the, the 1960s, they passed the Civil Rights Act. And I think it was Lyndon Johnson who said, basically, once they passed this act, they, they handed uh, the South to the Republicans because the Dixiecrats were basically going to change uh, their allegiances to from the Democratic Party to the Republican because the Democratic Party chose to pass this act. What is lesser known, though, is that even though that the Democrats or Democrats supported uh, this this act and they kind of hosted it, um, they actually voted less than the Republicans. The Republicans voted, 80% uh, of Republicans voted for the Civil Rights Act when it came up. Only 66% of Democrats did. So the Republicans were more in favor for civil rights than Democrats, um, which is, is kind of interesting. It's, and it's probably because of the Dixiecrats, unfortunately. Um, so what happened? So they handed, this is, this is kind of what Ezra Klein says, is they handed the, uh, they, they handed the, uh, what was it? The Dixiecrats to the Republican Party. And the Dixiecrats with segregation, with traditionalist ideas, were actually more ideologically in alignment with the Republican Party. And this kind of alignment or this sorting, which is what Ezra Klein calls it, um, started there. And it only continued after the civil rights movement. So before the Republicans were both included conservative and liberal, but since this kind of gate between the Dixiecrats and the Republicans changed, then it opened, you know, opened the door to basically Republicans becoming more and more conservative Democrats becoming more and more liberal. Cool. So one of the aspects that you get when uh, when the Republicans become more conservative and the Democrats become more liberal is that their identities kind of solidify. The policies that they approve of um, are more known by the voters. It's, again, before in the 1950s, it was kind of a mishmash. You know, you didn't actually know who to vote for because they were both kind of supporting the same thing. This made it such that the Republican identity and the liberal identity was distinct. Um, right. So... When that happens, you have uh, two groups. You, you're clearly able to distinguish, if you see yourself as a Democrat, you're able to distinguish yourself from a Democrat to a Republican. And that creates the concept of a group, which is me versus them. And uh, that is what happens in chapter three. 
your brain on groups. And so Ezra Klein goes into kind of the psychology between what it means to be me versus them, um, what consequences that has, and how that kind of factors into the political landscape that we have today. Uh, before I continue, though, I'm going to go get some water. So I'm going to put on my fancy... Uh, oh, I don't have a scene for... I'll be back soon. All right, I'll be back. I'll be back soon. It'll take like a minute. Put on some music for you. Alright, I don't usually talk this much, so I need the water. <clears throat> Alright, going to chapter 3. I just like read a little bit of the book, just so you can get kind of a feel of what it's like. This is the, oh, maybe I'll just leave the music on. It's kind of nice, actually. Sounds like a club. I was playing music before on Spotify, just on my own playlist, and then I learned that that's not what you're supposed to do on Twitch. So I found a playlist that is with, un, uh, not uncopyrighted, but music that has a license so that you can play it on stream. People won't get angry, so that's that. FYI, instead of, in, in case you want to start a Twitch stream one day. Alright, uh, so this is chapter three of your brain on groups. And uh, I'll just read a couple paragraphs, and then we can kind of talk about what notes I've written down. So it says, in 1970, Henry Todgefell published a paper with the anodyne title. That's a strange word. Experiments in intergroup discrimination would prove among the most important in social psychology. And even today, it stands as one of the most unnerving windows into the subroutines of the human mind. Tajfeld began by recalling a Slovene friend of his detailing the stereotypes his countrymen had for Bosnian immigrants. Tachfeld didn't record what those stereotypes were, but they stuck with him. He thought he had heard them, or something like them, before. He decided to test his hunch. Sometime later, I presented this description to a group of students at the University of Oxford and asked them to guess by whom it was used and to whom it referred, he writes. The almost unanimous reply was that this was the characterization applied by native English to colored immigrants. People come primarily from the West Indies, India, and Pakistan. All right, so that's a couple of paragraphs of the book. You can kind of get a feel of how it reads. I, I, overall, I thought I actually read really well. Um, sometimes I lost myself, but overall the flow is really good. Like the words uh, didn't work against the book. Um, it was simple enough and uh, each sentence kind of logically flowed with each other. Sometimes I read a book and it goes into the, like 10 sentences of just description and then I just forget kind of like what's going on. So uh, I mean this is a nonfiction book so there wouldn't be that much description but still it, it does a good job. It's it's good good read. Um, you can I flew by in a couple of days actually 
And then I spent the next day kind of writing notes and looking into it. But, uh, but yeah, again, I'd recommend it. It's, it's a good read. You can probably find it at your local library. It's, uh, it's like, it's new, so it's, it might not be available, but it's also, uh, like, the, uh, you're getting kind of a time where the people who have bought the book don't really want it anymore, and they might donate it to a library, so that might be extra copies. So, I'd take a look. But, it's, it's, I bought it, and, I don't know. It was kind of an impulse buy. Chapter 3. Alright, so again, kind of where we left off is that um, since the 1950s, be the difference between a Republican and a Democrat was not very well known. And they were actually the policy decisions and what it, the liberal versus conservative ideology between the two was pretty uniform. And so people didn't really know how to vote. Um, However, I'll turn the music a little bit down. Let's do it on my headset. Cool. Um, but as time went on, because of the civil rights movement, because of this sorting process that happened, uh, and if the sorting process doesn't make sense, I can explain that a little bit. Um, I, I made a diagram for myself, and um, it's just it's hard to explain through text. <clears throat> um, but basically, the identities uh, polarized towards certain identities. So the Democrats, um, what it means to be a Democrat becomes more defined and what it means to be a Republican becomes more defined. And, that, and that's in the geographic sense. That's in the cultural sense. That's in the racial sense. Um, so the more sorted, the more you can easily define what it means to be a Democrat, and what it means to be a Republican. Today it's it's very simple because it's it's very much sorted. It's very much polarized. So assuming that we have these sorted polarized groups, the Democrats and the Republicans, what does this mentality, this us versus them, do to the political landscape? And uh, Klein basically goes back to a paper published in 1970 called uh, by Henry Tajfel. Um, that um, th th there's, there's lots in the book that go over the study and I'm only going to touch on it briefly. Um, but one of kind of the base ideas is that immediately when we identify someone as an other, we have already brought in our kind of negative or uh, disalignment with them. Uh, if we don't see it as a part of us and an other, like we've already basically uh, from the outset, given a negative viewpoint on them, like we're not with them. Um, and then, then after, when we need to make an argument to someone else why we're against them, that's when the rationalizations come. We're not against them for because of some rationalization that we came up with. We're against them because the minute that we met them, we labeled them as another, and we basically didn't cross that bridge. And he does studies, uh, Taj Fell, that goes over in the book about how they brought a bunch of students together. And even though the students didn't have any, uh, didn't have any, uh, like there wasn't any rational reason for them to um, help each other in this kind of fake scenario. Um, they still helped each other in their own groups, even though there wasn't any rational reason to. So. Um, so the, another argument that Klein makes is that the division between Democrats and Republicans has made this seem like politics is a sport. And I'm not, not sure if you have ever kind of been emotionally invested in a sports team, but when it comes down to the game, it, all, all, all that matters is winning. And winning means beating the other team at any cost. And uh, that's kind of goes with the idea of negative partisanship, where you're if your if your team is like not good enough, you might start instead of being good at the sport, you might start 
trying to make the other team bad. Um, that's kind of what we started to see. And, uh, Clank goes into this a little bit later in the book, but um, Republicans and Democrats are, are starting to threaten the rules of the game in order to win. They're starting to do things that are not constitutional. Um, you saw the impeachment of Trump for trying to bribe the is it Ukrainian prime minister to um, to like help him get reelected. Like there's there's lots of bending of the rules that are happening just so that your team can win. And and in this sense, it's actually quite a worrying time for our country because if no one's going to play by the rules and everybody just wants to win, then how far will we go? So, uh, again, if you've been a fan of the sports team, you kind of, everybody refers to it as, you know, my team, which means that it's, it's a part of your identity. It's not just like a belief that you have that that team's good. It's like, this is my team. When this team wins, I feel good because it's my team. Uh, so it's inherent in your identity that this team does well. And when it's part of your identity, it becomes much more emotional for you. It's a personal commitment. It's not a belief system. Um, so the more engaged you are in politics, the more you see that your party is your team and uh, the more wrapped in, wrapped, wrapped up that you get in politics, the more polarized you get. He says this later. Um, and so the more emotion, the more identity we put into politics, the more that people engage. And the more that people engage, the more um, polarized their views are going to be. Oh, okay. Yep. And uh, there is this uh, idea of um, we have certain identities. It's not just political identities. There's there's social identities. There's racial identities. Cultural identities. Like, um, I could say I'm I'm a male. I'm a mid-aged uh, white, and currently. It's like a societal norm to not hate on identities. Like uh, if I went to a job and they said, we're not gonna hire you because you're a guy, um, that would be discrimination. There's, there's laws against that. However, political identities are fair game. Say, I hate you because you're a Democrat. Yeah, there's no laws against that. And so kind of one of the arguments he makes is we have lots of repressed feelings about um, feelings that we have, you know, whether they're good or bad, um, they're repressed, and uh, we need to get them out. We need to get that hatred out, and kind of this political sphere where it's okay to hate political identities um, is kind of an outlet for that. And you're not just hating the political identity. Or the political identity has all the other identities attached to it. So all this, like, if you're a Democrat, you're more likely to be diverse. So you might be a certain ethnic culture. You might be an immigrant. Um, so instead of saying I hate a certain you know, race and be called racist, you could say I hate Democrats. And you know, you're just using your repressed feelings to, and it just kind of intensifies the game. Um, Okay. Okay, so press secretary of your mind, chapter four. So this is this interesting concept um, where we have our human capacity to reason and rationally think and seek the truth. Um, however, we're actually very fallible. Um, we come up with rationalizations based off of what we want to believe. Uh, and the best, this isn't in the book, but kind of the best example I can come up with here. Oh, hey. Pay 7 What's going on, man? What did you link there? 
Sorry, we're just going over uh book why we're polarized. Or I guess I am doing it for myself, but you can come on for the ride if you want. So chapter four, press secretary of your mind. Um So when you when you ask a question, when you want to find some truth, some hidden truth, you have to ask a question, but sometimes that question we call a leading. And then <laughs> I don't know, man. What do you want to... Why do you want me to watch it? How do I know it's it's not a Rickroll? Is it a Rickroll? Your song? Do you make music? Alright, we're... I'm sorry. But maybe once I get through uh, the book, I'll, I'll listen to it. I can, I'll send you a Twitch message after if you want some feedback on it. Does that sound, does that sound good? How's your day going? Oh, you speak Spanish. Okay. Uh, is it, uh, how do I say? No, uh, I, I took Spanish in high school and I don't remember any of it. All right, I'm, I'm going to continue, but if you have any questions about what I'm, what I'm talking about, ah, uh, sorry, man. Um, I'm going to continue with the Why We're Polarized book. Uh, so what I was saying is, uh, so when, when we're trying to find some kind of truth, we first have to ask a question. And that question we think to be some kind of, has some objective qualities to it. It's like you're trying to basically remove your bias from it as much as possible. Um, but there's always kind of a leading parts to that question like why why is that question important in the first place like the kind of the subject of the question you have to have care for and just by having care for that thing um you're basically bringing in your beliefs why you why you care about that thing so all questions are kind of seeking for an answer even before they're asked there's really no god objective viewpoint out there where we can ask questions that don't bring in any of our beliefs and this questioning or this rationalization, when you're in groups, uh, it basically reinforces itself because the group has a single belief system and everybody asks questions to the group and they get the answers that they want because, you know, they have the same beliefs and it kind of just continues. And so these groups create these narratives and these rationalizations that seem like they're all reasonable. They seem like they're all objective. Um, but they're all kind of leading to the thing that they want to believe. And it's, it's very similar if, if you search anything on Google, for example. Uh, like, you can search anything and someone will validate what you want to say. Uh, it's it's kind of kind of insane. So think of that, that same idea where you can Google something, get any kind of validation that you want. Think of that on a kind of a global level with large groups and political parties. You go to a, a democratic, go to a party with a bunch of, you know, Democrats, and um, if you ask a question about something that they care or believe about, you're going to get an answer that's going to be very democratic. <clears throat> so I guess the question is, how do we lead our discussions so that we get uh, unbiased answers? Um, and we kind of see this in politics today where like climate change for example um we we think that it, only if we had enough information if we only had the facts 
um, that we could basically uh, convince the people who are in charge, like Trump, to make decisions to combat climate change. But we've seen that it's clearly false because we have mountains of evidence. We have mountains of studies. Um, so just by having more data and more facts isn't going to convince um, the other side that you're right. It's not just that there's a misunderstanding between the two sides. It, it's like you can't just give someone facts and then they'll start understanding you. Um, and, it, and it doesn't work because uh, since you, you can't win an argument in politics by refuting, refuting the other's argument. You know, if their beliefs are tied to their identity and that's who they are, you can't just say, oh, you know, one plus one equals two, therefore your your identity is false. You know, they, they will cling on to that identity and they will they will not even uh, accept what you have to say. Um, and actually, uh, I think this, this happens later in the book also, but if, uh, if you show uh, Republicans or you show Democrats um, different kind of tweets or social media that is the other party's kind of message, that kind of shows like facts about what argument they're trying to make, they will actually believe it less after seeing those facts. Um, because they just, they'll, they'll see it, and the way that they react to it is um, they need to basically reinforce their own beliefs more in order to combat that thing. They don't try to believe what's in front of them. So trying to basically give the other side more information actually does more harm than, um, than, <laughs> than giving no information. So... There's an argument there to not communicate, which is kind of ridiculous, but um, it kind of makes sense. Um, and then he references another study uh, that a Yale professor, uh, Dan Cohen, did, where um, even good data won't persuade skeptics. So um, again, climate change. You have a bunch of data from the studies that we've done and give it to someone who's skeptical about climate change. Um, it's they're not they're still not going to believe it because of this thing called identity protective cognition and what that means is uh, and this is a quote from the study and I'll read it this is a, as a way of avoiding dissonance and estrangement from valued groups individuals subconsciously resist factual information that threatens their defining values so it's not that you're actually like consciously trying to fight something it's that even when the facts come you have this subconscious urge to just not give them any weight. Um, you don't really give it a second thought. It's like you just kind of gloss over it. And you do that in order to reinforce your defining values. Uh, again, that's called Identity Protective Cognition uh, by Yale professor Dan Cahan. Okay. Do chapter five in a second. Let me get some more water. So the demographic threat. Um, so the, the question is, or not the question, um, polarization has been happening. The sorting process has been happening since the 1950s up until now. Why is it right now that we're starting to see kind of uh, radical amounts of polarization? Why is it so, you know, conflicting right now? And um, I guess the biggest thing that comes to mind, at least for Ezra Klein, is we're reaching this Machiavellian moment. Um, and let me actually show you what that actually means. Uh, Klein doesn't use this term, but uh, my pr professor used this term. And it's a, it's a moment when a new republic first confronts the problem of maintaining the stability of its ideals. So it's a Machiavellian moment in the fact that 
This is the first time in history where white Christians will not be the majority in the United States. Um, they've been losing power over the years, but this is the time when they're not going to be in control anymore because just, you know, demographics change. You have more immigration. Uh, the boomers are becoming older. Um, like, uh, whites are, like, the middle age, or the, the average age of whites is much older than the average age of all these different uh, demographics, Asian, Latino. Um, so we're kind of reaching a moment where uh, America, which used to be run by a majority of white Christians, is it's going away. And when your group starts losing power, that's when you start identifying with your group more and wanting to preserve it. And that's kind of what we're seeing with the, I think, the Republicans. Um, so with the increasing immigration, the waning population of the white and Christians were hitting this moment where the whites are seeing that their power is being lost and they're going to do anything that they can get to retain that power. It's kind of an existential moment for them. Uh, and this is a, this is a concept that I really like that doesn't just apply to uh, politics, um, but it's the idea that when something is decaying or losing force or losing momentum, what it does is that it tries to basically create rules so that it can basically stop change. Um, versus things that are growing, things that are kind of blossoming, don't need any rules. They're just kind of they're they're just going to do what they continue to do because what they're doing is is working and so uh, the whites are kind of reaching this moment where they're losing it and they need to enact change and or they need to do something about it um, and in, in 2018 laura ingram said uh, this kind of like makes the point of the kind of republican party said uh, in some, in some parts of the country, it does seem like the America that we know and love doesn't exist anymore. So again, kind of tending to this idea that America used to be run by the majority white and Christian, and we're losing that, and that's a bad thing. And uh, there's a wanting to go back, you know, Trump with the slogan, make America great again. Um, and what's interesting is that the, the identity of being white wasn't really a thing until it got threatened. You know, I don't remember five years ago thinking of myself as a as a white person. It, and it's just not an identity that I identify with. I mean, I think some people take their race more in, into who they are, and that's it's, I, if that's that's great. I have nothing against that. Uh, it's, everybody has things that they tie themselves to. And it's what makes them them. But the kind of the idea, the idea, at least from a global level, of being white as an identity wasn't really a thing until it got started getting threatened. Um, and uh, let's see. So yeah, recently, uh, I guess Ashley Hardina from Duke University, a political scientist, did a study where 30 to 40 percent of the white population feel a strong and growing sense of racial solidarity, which again did not exist 20 years ago. Um, but interesting enough, they they don't feel a, against any other kind of. It's it's not out of feeling of racial hostility against any other uh, races. It's just racial solidarity. It's kind of pride in being white. Um, you kind of see with the MAGA hats and things like that, uh, how, how that's becoming a thing. And yeah, so the easiest way to activate, the, the, a lot of the vocabulary here is uh, like activating an identity. He uses that a lot in the book. So you activate someone's identity, in this case being white when you're threatened. And uh, there's a cool quote in here that I liked. This is, uh, when, when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. So again, just restating, you know, whites were privileged. Um, they inherited um, certain uh, 
uh, certain things that uh, other uh, demographics didn't. And when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. So they're, it, they feel like they're being oppressed because of this change that's happening. This is kind of the demographic change where the whites are no longer the majority in the country. Yeah, it is a pretty great quote. <laughs> That's why, yeah, I, I should put that somewhere. How you doing, uh, Lament TV, TV? Okay, so. Yeah. So now I feel the same way about finding some things in perspective. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like you don't you don't feel it until it's like actually you're facing it, and uh, <laughs> maybe I mean you would you would hope that when the whites start like the white supremacists start feeling threatened, they're like, oh, this is how everybody else felt. Maybe this is this is something that we can all kind of you know group around and like try to understand better and. You know, don't discriminate each other because it's, it's it's bad when you feel discriminated against. Okay. So the question becomes, how do we bring people in the game of politics? This is the idea of uh, what was it? Uh, there's a political uh, theorist. Uh, his last name's Oakshot. I, th I think this is Oakshot. Um, but it's. And this is not related to the book. This is just from the class that I'm taking. Um, but kind of the central question of politics is that what makes a pol what makes a government uh, legitimate is that such that everybody who enters kind of the political arena feels like there's a fair and fighting chance for them to basically represent themselves. It's that moment when you feel like it's hopeless and whatever you do in the current system um, can't help them. That's when the government is no longer representing you. It's no longer legitimate. And so, in the sense here, um, how do we how do we bring kind of this traditional white bring things back the way they are to this new changing, you know, diversity demographic? How do we bring them together in such a single kind of government where everybody feels like? They're being represented. It feels like they have a fighting chance to kind of uh, be a part of the country in the way they want to be a part of the country. And uh, a lot of uh, political philosophy in the 20th century, it, it's basically not trying to create a systematic, this is how things ought to be. It's creating a plurality. Oh, sorry, I can't say that word plurality um, where you have lots of different groups with lots of different beliefs uh, lots of different ways of evaluating what is civil what is right um, how do you basically keep people into a single organization where there are differences and you want to embrace those differences but you want to embrace them up to the amount that they're not conflicting with one another if you want to read more about that and again this is not part of the book but uh john rawls who's a political theorist and uh, again 20th century um has this idea of uh difference where basically government should uh should only basically work in the scope where uh people have agreement on things where, where people have different ideas it shouldn't impose any of beliefs on the people um that's just a side note. All right, getting to chapter six. We're, we're almost done. And my my voice is starting to die. I guess we still have a little bit of ways to go. But... So, so half of the book is about kind of diagnosing what happened in the 2016 election, what's been happening for the last you know, 50 years. The second half is more about how this process is accelerating, how polarization is accelerating. Um, and chapter six starts it off and it's basically targets the internet 
um, as kind of a polarizing force. And I'll, I'll kind of go into that now. Um, if you have a TV or YouTube or whatever, um, kind of news is like another show, like Grey's Anatomy or uh, what are other shows? <laughs> I don't watch enough shows. House or things like that. Um, it vies for attention among a populace for entertainment. Uh, it didn't always used to be this way. You know, there wasn't all that choice that was out there before the internet. People had a certain few channels and or a newspaper, and they didn't have a choice. They just got it from the same source every time. And so there wasn't really there wasn't any incentive for political news channels to change uh, their content in order to attract users. So they, they, they would, you know get the users they want and they just keep on kind of writing the news that they would but in the internet you go on the internet sorry it's been a long day you go on the internet and um, there's lots of different shows there's lots of different kind of news sites there's lots of different there's lots of choice and in order to compete with all of those things news needs to be more attention grabbing and this is kind of what we're seeing with the news. So how do you make news more attention grabbing? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. You make it, you know, uh, make it extreme, right? You kind of tailor to audiences that like extreme things. So if you have a range of people who are, say, Democrat, you have some people who are more independent, who have kind of moderate views, and then you have a very extreme um, Democrats who want maybe uh, basic income. Um, so when news happens where maybe a California city wants to try basic income, that's what's going to be put out there. That's that because people are going to click on that more. It's you know whether some one passes a bill to increase the budget for some health care program that's kind of accepted both by Democrats and Republicans. That news is not exciting enough to, I mean, it's great news, but you don't see it very much. Uh, you, you see kind of the really, the ends of the spectrum. It's, it's because that's how news is going to compete with all the different shows out there, all the different entertainment media that is available. Because um, if, if they don't get viewers, then they're not going to succeed as a business. It's just capitalism. <clears throat> All right. So what, what's interesting is that um, back, I, f I forget who said this in the book. Uh, it mentions this, uh, who said this, but there's an idea where the freedom of information would result in basically a more pure democratic state. You know, people would get the information they need. They can make the decisions that they want to make. They can get informed by what's happening. Um, and you know, we've got the internet. There's lots of information on there, but it, it seems like it's 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 not working. And the reason why it's not working is just as much we have more information, uh, we also have information from lots of different sources. So there's so much more choice, and which one to believe, which one not to believe. Um, especially when I was saying before, where uh, all these different news sources are competing with each other, so they need to write the most kind of polemical story. Um, it's actually hasn't really done us any good at all, this more news or more information on the internet. And uh, political journalism is, is a business that serves people who are interested in political news and tries to create more people who are interested in political news. So they're not just trying to get attention, but they're also trying to create this reinforcing cycle where they're trying to get their users more engaged in politics by the stories that they write. Because if they can get more people to kind of be emotional or be kind of invested in politics, then they're going to get more returning users. And to get them more emotionally interested, what you have to do is, uh, I think this is right now. You can you can fuzz the facts, I guess. Um, but uh, again, one of the kind of common themes of this book is that you have to tend to identities. So uh, I'm sure you saw, or I don't know if you saw, but the the BuzzFeed stuff that happened 10 years ago. Is it 10 years ago? It's not that long, is it? 
uh, maybe it started 10 years ago, but it's like, uh, what was it? Like, uh, you wouldn't believe uh, right here, like X things only Y people would understand. Those things went viral. They were so attention grabbing. Everybody wanted to do them. And it's the reason why BuzzFeed figured this out is because it, it tailors to identity. It's identity media in its purest form. And identity is something that you're personally attached to. It's your identity. And so you care a lot about it. And then, you know, in this case, like X things that you why wouldn't understand, those are fun things. But if you start talking about you know, things in the political context about your identity, then you're going to get very emotionally involved in that. Um, so political journalism tailors to certain identities in order to get them involved into politics so that they care more. And the more they care about, the more they're going to kind of keep on reading certain polarized articles that are coming out that are supposed to be tension grabbing. And it's, 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 a, it's a very bad feedback cycle. I think that's what Ezra Klein is, is trying to say here. Um, and I'll read this quote. I picked this out from the book. But an identity, once adopted, is harder to change than an opinion. An identity that binds you into a community you care about is costly and painful to abandon. And the mind will go to great lengths to avoid abandoning it. So again, you can have like a belief, and if you let go of that belief, it doesn't really say anything about you. It's just, you know, I thought it was true because of X, Y, and Z, and you know, it, it doesn't really affect my life, so I'm just gonna let that go. But an identity, it's, it's not something you can just let go. It's, it's a part of yourself. It's, 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 it's something that if someone attacks, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna defend it, and you're not gonna give it up. So again, media tailoring two identities, trying to get them engaged in politics. Cool. Um, and there's, there's also this other interesting idea that he comes out with here. Uh, where news is, news is supposed to, I, I guess in the ideal sense, news is supposed to be a reflection of reality, what's happening in the world. I think that's probably the initial inspiration of why news came about, maybe. Um, but today it's also a creating force. It, it creates things as well. It doesn't just reflect things. And the common question is, what is newsworthy? I think you can come up with a basic answer of newsworthy is something that we should all know about, but that's a subjective question, right? What is newsworthy? And you look back at the 2016 election and there's lots of important policies to be covered. Foreign, you know, uh, how we deal with foreign countries, the economy. But those were not as newsworthy as like Hillary Clinton's emails. It's, it's, it still baffles me how all that happened, but basically the media decides what's newsworthy and the media basically puts things out that are going to be attention grabbing and polarizing. So the most polarized things are going to be the most newsworthy. Um, again, just kind of a, a bad feedback cycle. It kind of diverts our attention to things that might not be very important. Um, because that's what the audience wants to hear. All right, that was chapter six. Chapter seven, post-persuasion elections. This is a short one. Um, so the way that campaigns were run for a president, or at least I guess for any kind of party, um, before 2000 was run in order to persuade uh, people who are undecided in their vote to vote for your party. However, as things became more polarized, you know, people started identifying, I'm voting for a Democrat or voting for a Republican. There was less of that middle ground where there were independents who were undecided. And it happened in the, I think, 2004 election, uh, Bush's, uh, his campaign advisor, I think, basically made a bet in saying, we're not going to spend any time trying to convince the people in the middle to vote for us. What we're going to do is 
There's so few people there, it's not even worth our time. What we're gonna do is we're gonna spend all of our campaign budget advertising to activate our base. Because there's more people on our base than... So it basically, campaigns are now not spending any time trying to make a good persuasive argument for people to come to their side. What they're trying to do is they're trying to uh, create ads or create a vision that basically resonates with their base. Um, so that creates even more division because there's, again, no middle ground. It's either you're going to vote for Democrat or you're going to vote for Republican. Um, there's, there's no really compromise for there. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, again, you try to activate your base as much as possible, which means your base doesn't understand the policies as much, so you need to basically approach them in a way that you can just get their attention. Um, and this is actually more possible now. Before, uh, political parties were kind of working with large companies and they would give them lots of institutional donations. I mean, it still happens. Um, and so the party didn't have to listen directly to their uh, their base. But now that there's grassroots campaigns, uh, Bernie Sanders, um, 